Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Alice Sabatino will defend the academic thesis Quadriceps Muscle Ultrasound as a new tool for diagnosing muscle wasting in renal diseases. May I invite you to present the summary of your work and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I will make a brief introduction on about the kidneys, uh, in kidney disease, and the effects of the kidney disease have on a skeletal muscle. I will present uh, briefly what is the method of quadriceps muscle ultrasound, and then I will present the findings of my thesis. The kidneys are two organs that are located in the abdominal cavity and are responsible for urine production and elimination of waste products. Uh, they are also responsible for blood pressure regulation and for the activation and production of some hormones. Uh, when uh, there is a reduction in kidney function, you have the, uh, the kidney disease. It can arise either acutely and it's called acute kidney injury or develop and worse over a more prolonged period of time. And then in this case, it's called chronic kidney disease and can lead, lead to end stage kidney disease. Acute kidney injury is more frequently observed in the critical care setting, while CKD, which is called chronic kidney disease, uh, is a result of systemic and kidney related chronic diseases. And as systemic diseases, the most important diseases that are responsible for chronic kidney disease is diabetes and hypertension. When uh, the, the kidney function is, is very reduced or absent, it's necessary to start a replacement therapy. And you have two options in the chronic setting. We have a dialysis. Uh, which can be hemodialysis and in the blood uh, passed through a machine which has a filter to remove waste uh, toxins and it goes back to the, to the body through arterial venous fistula. While in the peritoneal dialysis, uh, which you can perform at home, um, it's a home dialysis. You have the infusion of a dialyzer, the liquids of dialysis in the abdomen, and the peritoneum will work as a membrane to filter uh, the toxins of the body. It can happen uh, during the night in um, just a moment, in the pointer, during the night by an automated machine, or uh, you can do this during the day uh, manually. Um, kidney disease has very negative effects on skeletal muscle. It increases muscle degradation and reduces muscle synthesis, leading to muscle wasting. Uh, the causes of um, increased muscle degradation are related to the presence of comorbidities, such as diabetes, the, the dialysis treatment itself, which stimulates catabolism, um, patients on chronic, with chronic kidney disease have also um, frequently a low-grade inflammation, which also induces catabolism, and, and that is more pronounced in critically ill patients in the ICU when they develop acute kidney injury. Uh, frequently, patients present lack of appetite, also caused by the, um, by the uremic toxicity of waste products that uh, accumulate in the body, but also by the inflammatory status. Uh, the reduction of muscle synthesis is also related to the dialysis procedure, which um, in which um, protein and amino acids are lost in the dialysate, so you don't have substrate for muscle synthesis. Patients frequently have a sedentary lifestyle, which is also uh, the physical activities and an anabolic stimulus, so patients being sedentary, they don't have this anabolic stimulus. They also, the lack of appetite is also a cause of reduction of muscle synthesis because you don't have the substrate also for muscle synthesis. And the old age of patients, uh, majority of patients are elderly and the elderly have a reduced muscle synthesis stimuli. 
The skeletal muscle evaluation in current, the current practice at the bedside is usually performed by bilateral impedance or anthropometric measures. Those are the two uh, most used uh, methods at the bedside. Uh, however, they do not uh, measure muscle. They are surrogate methods. They estimate you know, the lean mass or uh, using equations, you can estimate muscle mass. And also they have important limitations because they can suffer the influence of fluid overload. And patients with kidney diseases often have an excess fluid in their bodies leading to edema. And this edema can mask or can falsely increase um, lean, mass, lean, muscle, lean muscle mass lean mass and the amount of muscle. So we try to develop this, we developed this methodology uh, of quadriceps muscle ultrasound in which we have um, here in this figure, you can see the rectus femoris muscle and, and below you have the vastus intermedius muscle. And this is the image that we obtain by applying the linear array in the, um, in the, quad, in the quadriceps of the patient. Uh, here, the, second, the other figure, we have the two points of assessment. Uh, we study the midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine and the top of the patella, and also the lower two thirds of the same distance. And here is me performing this measurement in a volunteer and the image that I obtained. And we used study the, uh, the thickness of the muscle, the diameter of the muscle. So we wanted to know if this methodology was better than the current practice. For that, we performed six studies. First study, we studied the reliability of the, method the methodology. Then we validated against uh, computer tomography. We used it to identify cases of malnourished patients in hemodialysis to monitor mus muscle status of patients. And also we studied it in relation to mort mortality risk in comparison to anthropometry and diagnosing sarcopenia together with hand grip strength in comparison to brain impedance analysis. This is the first study, reliability of the muscle ultrasound in patients in the ICU with acute kidney injury. We per first performed a repeatability study, which was to assess difference between measurements of the same assessor and no difference between measurements we perform a blind, blind measurement and then compare them. Um, this is the reproduci reproducibility study. So two different assessors performing measurements in the same patient. And you see that this very small difference of nearly 0 0.4 millimeters between assessor, assessor was is statistically significant. However, it's a very, very small difference, 0.4 millimeters, which is not clinically relevant. And the intraclass correlation coefficient, which is the coefficient used to study if assessors had similar measurements, uh, it was very high, it was above 0.90. And also we perform measurements before and after dialysis to see if the methodology suffered from fluid shifts, uh, rapid fluid shift, and if the fluid overload would increase in muscles and no, no difference in measurements were found. We validated the methodology against computer tomography. In green, we have muscle ultrasound measurements and in blue, the CT measurements with no difference between measurements. And this graphic is the Van Dautman plot in which we studied the bias of the measurements and if they were very different from the, the CT. We applied the methodology to study the skeletal muscle in patients on hemodialysis, and we found that patients on hemodialysis had lower quadriceps muscle thickness, uh, se separated by hectus femoris and vastus intermediums, in, in comparison to health subjects, even correcting by age and gender. Also, we divided patients in malnourished and well-nourished based on a well-recognized tool with the malnutrition inflammation score. Um, that's partially subjective and partially objective too. And we found that patients that had a worse malnutrition inflammation score, which is above six, had also reduced its uh, quadriceps muscle thickness in comparison to patients that were considered well nourished, showing that the methodology was also able to identify patients that were considered malnourished by well established um, tools. 
then we use it to assess its capacity to monitor muscle status. So we studied patients in the ICU in which uh, muscle wasting is very important, especially in the beginning of the, the, the hospitalization. And we measure patients at baseline within 72 hours from admission and after five days. And we found an average percent reduction of 15% of uh, muscle. And this was a small study with 30 patients, but we have also this very interesting analysis that should be also confirmed in other studies in which the severity of muscle wasting related with the probability to be discharged home or to have a prolonged stay. Patients with higher loss of muscle mass uh, had increased probability to, to endure a prolonged stay in comparison to patients that had lost less muscle. Then we studied it uh, regarding a mortality risk in 181 hemodialysis patients. In this graphic, you see that patients with lower muscle mass assessed by ultrasound had also a worse survival. And we compared to anthropometry. And we have in the fully adjusted analysis a more than twofold increase in mortality risk when assessing low muscle status by muscle ultrasound and less important results with anthropometry or even not significant. And by applying the last study, the muscle ultrasound and beam impedance analysis for the diagnosis of sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle mass and strength, uh, together with hand grip strength, which is a tool to assess muscle strength, we found that patients that had sarcopenia by using quadriceps muscle ultrasound to identify low muscle mass had a worse survival and that more than threefold increased the risk of mortality. And no difference we were found with patients when we diagnosed sarcopenia by using view impedance analysis. So the conclusions that uh, we had with my, thesis, with my thesis is that muscle ultrasound has a good reproducibility and repeatability when we can, when op different operators that undergo proper training and similar training before applying it. It's not influenced by fluid status, so it's reliable in the case of fluid overload. It's accurate and precise in comparison to CT. And it's sensitive to detect muscle changes in short periods of time, as you saw, we saw in patients in the ICU. So it could be used for monitoring interventions, physical and nutritional interventions. And finally, low muscle mass, as assessed by quadriceps muscle ultrasound, was also independently associated with increased mortality risk and um, performed better in comparison to anthropometry and beam impedance analysis. I thank you all for your attention and I give back the words to the prorector. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very clear presentation. Uh, we will now start with the uh, opposition. And the first opponent is uh, Professor Sprout, Professor of Rehabilitation of Chronic Organ Failure at Cyril Horn. Uh, he was also chair of the assessments commi assessment committee, Professor Sprout. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the candidates with a very nice thesis and also to the promoter team, uh, my congratulations. It's a very clinically relevant topic and also your background as an allied healthcare professional within the medical field, I really appreciate. I'm a physiotherapist by background and I think we can add a little bit to the medical field. So yeah. congratulations to the, for that. I also have some critical questions and some discussion. Um, on page 12, you have figure two of chapter one where you show the protein degradation and synthesis and the different factors that may contribute to the degradation and the synthesis. Page 12. Page 12. Of chapter one. Yes. Page 11. Sorry, page 11. Yes, oh, sorry. Okay, page sorry. 11. Uh, figure two. You mentioned very multiple factors about protein synthesis and degradation. Yes. Which one is the most important? I think it's, I, I, in reality, I never thought about the most important, but I think we have more factors increasing protein degradation, 
because also in patients that um, are not very cathetic, etc., you see a, a reduced muscle mass in these patients, even if they perform uh, some, are active in the daily living. So I think that the the degradation, the stimulus of degradation could be more important, having a, a greater effect on uh, on reducing muscle. And all, of all those factors that are, all those arrows that go towards degradation, which one, which one do you think is the most important? Because when it's aging, we don't have much probably treatment options. No, here in the synthesis, oh, we, we, can, in, we can intervene in sedentary lifestyle for the synthesis, we can intervene with uh, nutritional intake, uh, and these are the most the only two factors that we can intervene uh, to improve synthesis. So patients that are older will still have a reduced stimulus. So we can also work in the degradation part of this, maybe um, improving dialysis. We need to guarantee that dialysis is cleaning the body of the patient. It's an efficient dialysis. So you will have less toxicity, less, uh, you, will, you will also need to cure uh, metabolic acidosis, which is also a very important catab catabolic agent mm -hmm. and also keep in mind to be to control comorbidities patients that are diabetics must be uh, well balanced with their treatment and also the presence of inflammation if patients have infections so the degradation okay. part i think we can work more than the synthesis okay i, I interrupt you there because you yeah. say inflammation and comorbidities then i like to jump to chapter five Okay. In chapter five, I first like to discuss with you table one because you show data from patients and from healthy subjects. But I'm confused because the healthy subjects are younger, their BMI is lower, yes. the male female ratio is different. All those factors that you mentioned on page 11 as possible factors that may determine muscle mass. So, why did you choose this control group? So, the control group we use at um, younger subjects because when we study normative data to identify patients that are malnourished, it's recommended to use younger subjects. Here we are not doing normative data. We were not doing determining a cutoff, but we studied younger persons and then we adjusted the analysis by age and gender. Well, we were not able to match. Wouldn't that be easier just to recruit an elderly, an elderly group of healthy subjects and then you can just make the comparison with the elderly it, subjects without kidney disease yes it would have been easy to the analysis but not for the procedure of the study because we use it uh, hospital staff and okay we okay. had it was easier for us to enroll in such population okay then if i go to page 82 that's table two of uh, the same chapter okay you, you and you also presented that very nicely in your presentation that there's on average a 15 percent decline in muscle mass while the patients are at the icu yes and then in table two you have the different muscle uh, parts yes. and then i see the standard deviation behind the mean decline yes which suggests that if your measurement is reliable, that around 15% of the patients have an increase in muscle mass while at the ICU. How do you see those data? Yeah, there were some patients that uh, didn't lose or had a very small increase. And um, it's an interesting question because in, in reality, in the um, overall, we saw a very important law, so we didn't went to the to, to discuss that uh, mm -hmm. to that part of patients that might have increased it. But if you see for each muscle site, you, you the standard ratio is below the average. Well, so it's just, very, just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. You're, you, you look positive at the numbers. Yeah, okay. some parts are below the average. Yeah, I cannot exclude measurements. Errors. Uh, errors, yes. Okay, perhaps that will be discussed later by one of the yes, colleagues. Yes, yes. I have a final short question. You mentioned uh, uh, in at the uh, page 11 that comorbidities and inflammation are possible drivers of loss of muscle mass, but in this 
chapter where there's a clear loss of muscle mass is not correlated to inflammation and comorbidities. Sorry. What's the main reason why these people lost their muscle mass? So they are critically ill patients, they are in bed rest, and they have the inflammatory, the, the inflammation present, and they are in mobilization. Yes. But CRP is not related to the loss of muscle mass. So I would then put my money on the inactivity. Sorry? Uh, CRP, oh, the, the C-reactive proteins not related to muscle mass. I think the most important factor here, I think, is bad rest. Thank you very much. I give the word back to the pro -rector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the opposition will be continued by uh, a guest from abroad, from Brazil, who is online, Professor Cupari. She's professor of nephrology at the Universidade Federal de São Paulo in Brazil. It's Welcome, Professor Cupari. Thank you. This is not her on the screen. Her on the screen. Can you listen? Yes. Okay. Can you start? Okay. Yes, I can. Uh, thank you. First, I would like to thank Alice Sabatini, Sabatino for and her supervisors for the invitation. It is really an honor to participate in this thesis defense. Um, I have to say I was very impressed with your thesis and uh, it was a great pleasure to read it. My first question, Alice, is that the, the majority of uh, the patients in the cohorts were men. And uh, we know that there are differences between men and women regarding body composition. Do you think or do you have an idea or did you do any separate analysis comparing the reliability and validity between uh, men and women in, or are there any data comparing genders? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for a question, sorry. <laughs> So I noticed also that we had um, more men than women. That's because more men have chronic kidney disease or also are recovering in the ICU. Um, but for the reliability and the validity, we did not perform a different analysis uh, between men and women, not even for the whole cohort. We, when we investigated in the hemodialysis patients, we also did not separate them. We saw them as a group. So no, we don't have, but it's possible that we have differences, yes. And we noticed in the, um, in the last article uh, that we had less women and that's probably why the impedance analysis was not significant because at, at the end we had less women with lower uh, skeletal mass, so with lower um, lean body mass uh, and that probably uh, had an influence in the in the results. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, a very important finding of your study is that the the muscle ultrasound measurement was not influenced by fluid overload, and uh, this was based in the assessment of acute reduction of body water after the hemodialysis session. Uh, I was wondering if the performance would be the same regarding increase of body water that occurs, for example, in the interdialytic period in hemodialysis. Do you think there is any reason to consider that this would be different? I don't think there is a reason to think that would be different. We performed this assessment in two studies. One was in the acute the patients in the ICU, and the other one was in the hemod chronic hemodialysis patients. And they are, they are, the chronic hemodialysis patients are more stable because we don't remove, as in the ICU, that you can remove much more fluid from the patient during the uh, prolonged hemodialysis mm -hmm. and they are more stable in the chronic hemodialysis. So I don't think that could be a reason of why it would be different uh, to perform the measurement again in on the mo on Monday, you know, after in the, the longer um, interval of dialysis. I don't think it, there is a reason for that. But it could also be investigated. Okay, thank you. And um, another question is about your last manuscript. 
um, you showed the, the fully adjusted Cox model analysis that only when uh, the VI distal index was combined with low hand grip strength, uh, what is potentially representing sarcopenia, the association with mortality was significant. But when we look the hazard ratio of uh, hand grip strength alone, and uh, the value was greater than that of muscle mass. And uh, it was significant in model two, when it's page 126. 126. Yeah. Yeah. Not 26, not page 20, 126. Okay. In page yeah. 120, yeah. the table. Yes, the table of the, the Cox analysis. Okay. okay, maybe mine is different. Uh, and the, in the model too, when you adjusted by age and albumin and it was significant, the hand grip strength. What made me think that maybe the influence of strength on the association with mortality seems to be stronger. Uh, any thoughts about that? Any other reason for, for that finding or cutoffs could be an issue in this relationship? Uh, yeah, I think that cutoffs could be an issue because uh, here we are using below the 50 percentiles as a cutoff and there are not, there are no, there were no cutoffs developed for the for quadriceps muscle ultrasound derived from normative population, so health subjects, and we don't have this cutoff yet. So it was arbitrarily chosen as to be used below the, um, the 50 percentile, and that could be a reason. And then also that muscle strength and muscle mass do not change in the same way. So not necessarily patients will lose muscle mass and strength in the same amount. And maybe that also could be one of the reasons that because why different studies have different results because populations can lose strength and mass in different ways. Uh, here uh, alone, it was not significant, but here in um, this population is a subpopulation from the manuscript in the, in the chapter prior. And we had mm -hmm. lower, uh, less people because we only had hand grip strength available for 64 patients. And so we reduced the, 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 the sample of the analysis, losing the, the, power, the power to find the statistical yeah. significance. Okay, thank you. And uh, my last question is, in the last part of your thesis, in the holistic assessment that you suggested, the, the measurement of muscle mass by ultrasound, by this technique, is part of the screening phase. Is that correct? And uh, yeah. since there is still no cutoff for low muscle mass, what do you suggest to identify the risk of malnutrition if we can use this method in clinical practice. Any suggestion how we can use it? So at the current moment, uh, we still don't have a cutoff to identify patients, but we can use it to monitor patients. So if we evaluate our patients twice a year, we can see if patients that are, are stable and not patients that are monitors, if we can evaluate them twice a year, for example, or depending on the need, we can see if patients are losing muscle and that is a sign of, um, of a beginning of uh, malnutrition. No? And I think that at the moment, muscle ultrasound would be very important, the monitoring part of the patient. Also, after we define a physical intervention or nutritional intervention, we could use it to see if muscle is improving, if we have some improvement in this, in this, in this part. Okay, thank you. And again, congratulations for this outstanding contribution for the body of literature. And also to provide us as dietitians a, a method that we can uh, use in clinical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kupari, for your contribution. 
uh, the opposition will now be continued by Professor Mess. Professor Mess is a Professor of Clinical Neurophysiology at this university. Professor Mess. Yeah, thank you. So I indeed uh, also think that your thesis is a really impressive example of how ultrasound uh, can contribute to daily patient care due to its bedside availability, low cost and ease of use. And your work proves that benefit by thoroughly performed studies whose results can readily be implemented in daily practice. So my congratulations to you and the team of supervisors. Well, especially the ease of use aspect of, of ultrasound can be a double-sided sport, since it suggests that almost no knowledge of the technique is necessary to perform it. And of course, I definitely do, do not agree to that. Actually, in your thesis, I didn't find that much about ultrasound methodology. And I thought the defense might be a good opportunity to catch up on this topic. Okay, okay you're ready to go? So my first question is, <clears throat> you measured the thickness of the muscles. And somewhere I read, sometimes we had to tilt the transducer a little bit. What do you think? What is the influence of that tilting on your results? Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you for uh, your very interesting question on the methodology of the ultrasound. So the tilting of the, the, the probe would help to um, improve the clarity of the image because we I wasn't pressing the muscle. It was a quantity of of gel usage is, is very high and we don't touch the skin of patients. I don't touch the skin of patients. And the only reason to tilt the probe was to have a more clear uh, image with the edges of the muscle. Okay, so you did it because you want to increase the visibility of the structures you want to see. Well, that makes perfect sense. But assume that I am the transducer and the wall opposite of me is the structure that I'm interested in. So if I would look into that direction, that would be zero degrees. And then I go, let's say 10 or 20 degrees, what will happen with the estimation of the distance between the transducer and the structure of interest? It could, it could change. Yes. How dramatic is that effect for evaluation? Because it was already discussed that the accuracy might that be that great. The accuracy, sorry. Mike. So what is the effect on this angle error on the accuracy of your data? Might this be a serious problem or not so serious? Uh, Any idea? Yeah, I need to think about it a little bit. Um, I think that when this, although we saw that the interclass correlation coefficient uh, between two operators was high, I think that if we want to prevent and um, those kinds of errors, it would be better to use the same operator. Yeah, to very good, very good answer. And I think this, this is a very good idea to, um, to argue from the side of the results and your results are pretty good. So it really doesn't matter. Even 20 degrees is only a, a mistake of 6%, forget it. Very good. In chapter seven, um, there is a citation, uh, number eight. It's a very active group and they examined a large group of patients on the ICU. And um, they also found this 16% decrease. But they didn't only measure the thickness, they also measured, measured the echolucency. Yes. What do you think of this? I think it's a very interesting and important measurement because echogenicity will tell you also the quality of that muscle because the the not only the amount of muscle is important, but the quality of muscle will influence also in the strength of patients uh, in performance in another. Okay, so you think it's a good idea? Yes. That you didn't do it. No. Um, what would you expect in this patient? What is going to happen with the echolucency? In the hemod chronic hemodialysis patients? <laughs> I would expect uh, that to sign a, fat a little bit of fat infiltration in comparison to health subjects. So will the muscle become brighter or darker? Brighter. Yes. Okay, I totally agree. But the echolucency is a difficult story because in the paper I just mentioned, there is a table and they mention that in one out of three patients, the subcutaneous fat 
dramatically increased. What would that do to your ecolucency picture? How is that influencing the gray value of your muscle? If you all of a sudden have a real increase of the subcutaneous fat. That is a very technical question. I would guess I'm saying that it would increase the brightness of the image in general, and that could yeah. signalize a more fat infiltration. Yeah, you really have to check it out because there are two different effects. Okay. First, the muscle will lie far further away from the transducer, so that will make it darker. Okay. But on okay. the other hand, if you have a dark structure in front of a bright structure, the bright structure will even get more bright. So you have to be very careful with okay. this kind of things. But the last question, is that okay? Okay. <laughs> so coming back to the results of this group I just mentioned, okay. they also found this 16% after five days, okay. as you did. So what's then so special about the kidney patients? I mean, it's the same story, right? Is right. it really specific for kidney patients? Yes, it's, it's the same story, but the kidney patients have this complex um, metabolic condition and they are fluid overloaded. And maybe we could see if we wanted also to see if they had a worse loss of muscle, if there is something more that was influencing uh, that, um, that muscle loss. But we found similar results. Okay, I really would like to just to continue this discussion, but this is not allowed. Thanks for your answers. I will <laughs> give back uh, the word to the project. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Franse. Dr. Franse is internist nephrologist uh, at the UMCG in Groningen, and he's online. Professor oh, Dr. Franse. Thank you. Uh, Madam Co-Rector, dear candidate, uh, first, I also want to congratulate you and your supervisors from Parma and Maastricht for this high quality thesis. Uh, with so many interesting publications, it was difficult to choose a chapter for a question. So I will start with a general question. What you basically did throughout your thesis is measure muscle quantity. And you showed that quadriceps muscle thickness correlates well with a worse nutritional status in hemodialysis patients and also predicts mortality. But there is also increasing evidence that dialysis patients do not only have a low quantity of muscle mass, sarcopenia, but also have a low quality of the remaining muscles. And this is reflected, for instance, by impair impairment of functional measures like hand grip strength or walking speed. So my question to you is, what do you think is most important for the quality of life and the prognosis in hemodialysis patients? A greater muscle quantity, so higher quadriceps muscle thickness, or a better mus muscle quality, so perhaps a greater hand grip strength? Steve Nopone, thank you very much for your question. That's a very interesting question because we are, I'm working with other colleagues uh, uh, right now in a meta-analysis mm -hmm. that is actually investigating that, which one is more important, performance, uh, strength, or, or mass, or everything together. And um, actually, putting together our papers, we couldn't find a very clear difference in which one's more important in the practice for mortality. But maybe for quality of life, when you have a reduced quality of the muscle, so reduced strength and cap reduced capacity to walk, maybe the quality of the muscle probably would have a um, major impact on quality of life uh, in comparison to the, the amount of muscle. Because if you have less muscle, but that muscle is healthy, maybe you, you can preserve more your, your strength um, and the capacity to, to walk and perform activities. Thank you for this answer, and I'm looking forward to that uh, meta-analysis. Uh, to follow up on this uh, uh, topic, my concern with ultrasound is that you can potentially overestimate the muscle quantity, because with ultrasound you do not only measure a muscle tissue, but also connective tissue, nerves, blood vessels, and, and fat, which has been mentioned before. Can you take away this concern? How, how, how much would would you estimate is the overestimation uh, by having more uh, other tissues than only uh, muscle tissue? Thank you for a question. Um, in 
in the assessment of muscle ultrasound, we stay inside of the edges to avoid um, other external tissues. And when we evaluate muscle thickness, it's the quantity of that anatomical part. Of course, to assess then uh, how much fat we have, we would have to evaluate in this case, echogenicity to estimate if the, the, the tissue that we are evaluating is a muscular, muscular tissue or if you have fat or fibrosis. So it would be better to combine measurements and assessments of the, the muscle. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you for this answer. My second question is on uh, another uh, way of uh, estimating uh, total muscle mass so not only in the quadriceps uh, region but total muscle mass and that's uh, by measuring the 24-hour urinary excretion of creatinine this parameter is also very sensitive to monitor changes for instance in the in muscle mass for instance during the stay in the intensive care unit so my questions to you are first have you considered to measure creatinine excretion in the 24-hour urine in the studies that you performed in the uh, ICU patients? And if you have those data, how did uh, the two correlate? So the, the quadriceps muscle thickness did it and changes in that, did it correlate with the urinary creatinine excretion and changes in creatinine excretion? Uh, in, actually, we did not um, measure creatinine excretion in patients, not even in the ICU or in the hemodialysis. And um, the Creatinine, the amount of creatinine, the, the 24 hour creatinine excretion, it's um, a way to, to estimate muscle mass, but it was also a surrogate and it can be influenced by other parameters, not only the amount of muscle, but also by intake uh, or protein intake could, could uh, have an influence in that result. But we never thought about measuring it, so I couldn't tell. The, um, I think it would have a correlation because and you are estimating, as we saw correlation with other surrogate methods in the in the, um, in the chapter four, I believe. Right. As we saw correlation with other uh, surrogate methods that um, assess skeletal muscle, I think it would have a correlation, but maybe not very strong. Thank you. And have I still time for one short question? Yes, you have. Yeah. I was surprised that there was no difference in uh, quadriceps muscle diame diameter before and after hemodialysis. When you would have asked me, I would have guessed that the di diameter would have been greater before dialysis because of uh, extra cellular uh, volume expansion, which would also yeah, be situated in the muscles. So, yeah, can can you explain this lack of a difference? Uh, <laughs> and uh, did you see any difference in in in, uh, in the quality aspect of of your or the grayscale uh, uh, that could suggest there was more fluid uh, before than after uh, dialysis measurements? And um, so I. I think the dialysis was removing more uh, um, external fluid. It was removing external fluid, and that did not influence it with the the volume of the muscle. And but I didn't notice difference. I couldn't tell if there was difference in the grayscale of the measurement. I no. we didn't measure it, so I I, I don't also I didn't rem no. I don't remember. Of, of seeing such a difference. Yeah. And could it be that the equilibration of fluid uh, takes longer than the four hours that uh, is usually uh, uh, the duration of the hemodialysis treatment? So that if you would do uh, an echo at a non-dialysis day, that you would see uh, a smaller width of the quadriceps muscle? I really don't think that would be a difference, an important difference in measurements. Okay. Thank you. I, I pass the word uh, back to the prorector. Thank you very much, Dr. Franzen. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Hemmelder. Professor Hemmelder is Professor of Nephrology at this university. Professor Hemmelder. 
Thank you. Dear candidate, I also wish to express my congratulations uh, for you and your uh, supervisors with, uh, with this thesis, which is rather interesting for a nephrologist, uh, just as I am. And uh, I, I saw that your uh, thesis focused on two groups of patients, high risk groups, I think, uh, that the patients have a good kidney injury at the ICU and uh, the hemodialysis dialysis, dialysis patients with um, rather high risk uh, up front. So I will focus my questions on chapter four. And I first want to go with you to figure two in that chapter in which you compare the results of the muscle thickness in a healthy control group mm -hmm. compared to hospitalized patients and the hemodialysis patients. Okay. Um, and if you, I saw in your uh, publication uh, list that you also did uh, research on kidney transplant patients uh, yes. and all the patients. And I'm very interested uh, what, what you would hypothesize about the values you would measure in patients with chronic kidney disease when you look at stage G and 3B, 2G, 4, 5. Okay. Would you also in those patients group expects uh, a rather uh, decrease of the muscle thickness if your measurements okay and why do you expect changes in this group highly esteemed opponent thank you for our very interesting question uh, we have planned to start uh, a study on chronic kidney disease patients on, not on dialysis in collaboration here with maastricht um, what I think that in the beginning of the disease, maybe we will find patients with um, more um, preserved skeletal muscle because they still don't have that much effect of the, 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 the metabolic derangements of the, the CKD, such as uh, metabolic acidosis, and they don't have the loss of proteins by during dialysis. So I think they would have a more preserved muscle and an important effect, maybe it would be their level of um, physical activity that could have a, an impact, uh, more impact and more pronounced in the difference of this patient. So we think it would be also important to assess that uh, in um, future investigation because I think that in those patients that might have a more important uh, uh, impact than the, the disease itself in the beginning. So you expect in the later stages of kidney, progressive to, kidney failure, yes. that you would measure differences. Yes. So it's important when you uh, monitor that group that you have serial measurements, I suppose. So we didn't start yet the, 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 the new study, uh, but yes, that could, that could be that. To, to have to monitor the patients over time during visits and to to see if muscle is reducing or if it's increasing and do you think your technique is sensitive enough to measure changes in time in yeah. those groups i think so because as we saw um, uh, okay it was a population that the the chapter okay let me remember chapter the chapter five it was a population that had a more pronounced loss of muscle in fewer in five days, but in the long run, patients that are chronic kidney disease, and if we don't do nothing, because that's the thing, that our, our aim as a clinician in the outpatient clinic is to preserve that muscle. So we would need to perform measurements without doing anything, leaving them by themselves. So. If we leave them by themselves, I think that we can see important difference over time. But in the outpatient, we want to keep the muscle and we can act to preserve the muscle. And maybe the changes would not be, we could, maybe, maybe we could not see changes. Okay. And, and if you want to study that kind of changes in patients over time, what we, would, would be your uh, study design to perform that? If I wanted to study in chronic patients, what yeah. would I do? Maybe I thought about uh, studying patients that um, perform physical activity, patients that don't perform physical activity, 
and but I would keep the treatment regarding diet and counseling, nutritional counseling. I would keep for everybody and see if that could make a difference in in, in muscle. So you would um, make an intervention group and compare yeah. different regular treated groups. You could make a diff intervention group, or, but also a pragmatic study in which we separate yeah. groups that are more active with groups that are not active, yeah. similar groups. Okay. And um, the next question I have is on the same chapter, because in uh, figure three, three and in table three, you, you um, give the analysis on different measures of uh, malnutrition. Yeah. From, and I thought from the table, the, the, the malnutrition information score is the most sensitive yeah. to detect patients with uh, decreased muscle mass. Yeah. And what do you think is the added value of your ultrasound measurements above those, for example, MIS score? Okay. Is there an added value? And is it an added value for each hemodialysis patients or do you um, advise a selection of patients which you would measure with ultrasound? Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, malnutrition inflammation score is a composite tool. So it will score patients uh, considering many different areas of assessment, not only the physical body composition, don't consider body composition. It consider appetite, um, performance of patients, how they're feeling, if they have symptoms and that. Of course, combined patients that have a more, that are more inflamed probably have a reduced muscle. But we cannot, with an inter a physical intervention, assess if we can, we are having an effect, a direct effect on muscle if we perform on nutrition formation score, because maybe they're still considered worse, but maybe their muscle is improving. We don't, we don't know. So I think that methodology would add, add this, this value in, in allowing us to monitor the effect of interventions directly in the muscle. Okay, but then it's very important that you also um, have research results which show that, that you can measure significant and relevant changes with your ultrasound technique, I yeah. think. So that, that, that's something we have to work out maybe in the future. Uh, and I think my, my um, impression is that if a patient has an, uh, a low uh, MIS in, in, the, in the clinical practice, you don't need ultrasound because you think that patient has, an, has not protein energy wasting. Do you agree on that? Or are there some patients with low MIS, which still have uh, decreased muscle mass measured with your technique? I don't agree that we wouldn't need to assess body composition in those patients because um, MIS does not does not directly assess body composition. It gives a sign. So yeah, patients that are that have a high score, of course they have low, but you can say for sure that patients that have a low score doesn't don't have low mass. So that's not what the data says. The data says that patients have lower if they are if they are, have a higher score, but we can't say that the other is the, the same results. Okay, thank you for your answers. I give back the word to the Prorector. Thank you very much. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Brewers. Dr. Brewers is researchers, researcher at the Department of uh, Huisartsgeneeskunde at this university. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, congratulations uh, with your thesis. It's a very interesting uh, topic. Um, what I also find uh, very interesting were some of your uh, propositions. Uh -huh. um, so I would like to ask your uh, paradigm to uh, read out loud uh, proposition number eight. Number eight. If we torture data hard enough, they will tell you something. Okay. 
Yes, I uh, was very surprised uh, from this uh, proposition because uh, when I look at your thesis, uh, you don't use uh, and analyze big data. So why did you put it uh, within your propositions? Steam uh, opponent, thank you for your question. So I was doing some research for my propositions because I was a little bit uh, unclear of, of what to do. And I read some different articles regarding research. And that's something that we, we see it's uh, a problem with also reproducibility in science. We have many, many papers that were not able to be reproduced. And now with the, the, the era of the big data, and that could be more pronounced if we don't check data and the analysis that we're doing because first the the science should be first was made that we have an hypothesis then we collect the data and then we analyze that now with the big data we are driving hypothesis from data so you can have a very um, huge amount of data that will give you some signs of finding something that might not be uh, correct, and then you test your hypothesis in that data from which you derived your um, hypothesis, and then we'll find uh, correlations that might not be true. And now we we have this also um, focusing always in novelty, and many times we have those very different results or new results, and nobody follows up on that because we need to always, always be publishing new stuff because journals want novelty and we leave that behind. So we have many studies that cannot be reproduced. So it's important to consider when we're driving hypothesis from data. Uh, and then I read an article that uh, statistical statisticians is already are trying some ad some adjustments, some new meta methods that I could not, I would not be able to to, to talk about here, that to consider that to this data-driven hypothesis instead of hypothesis collecting data. And that is why I, I wrote that proposition. Yeah. I, I agree with you that if you torture data long enough, it yes. will confess eventually. Yeah. Um, but don't you think um, when you uh, use big data um, and making data fair so you can reuse it, that it can also lead to um, just that novelty and founding some breakthroughs in yes. research. Yes, I think so. I think that big data, it's a very important resource that we have now. But it's important to maybe to go look at the data. You know which data you have, but instead of looking the numbers before, uh, thinking about your hypothesis, you need to first, you know what you wanna, what's your hypothesis, then you go and study your data. That's how we can have important um, results, important evidence that also should be followed through. We should follow up with the 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 new new data with the new evidence that we publish. Yeah, and are you planning to use big data in the future then, or? Are you still think we have enough on studies with 30, 40, 50 patients? Uh, I would like to, to perform <laughs> big data analysis, of course, but I would I, I don't have right now any um a plan anything planned with big data from I don't know multi-center studies, clinics that collect data. I, unfortunately I don't have it. I would like to work with big data. I, I am not against big data. It's just uh, the way of we look at it that we need to be careful. But I think it's very it's a very powerful um, information. It's very important to have them. I uh, I do very much uh, agree uh, with that. <laughs> Alice Sabatino, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company uh, await the results of our deliberations here and uh, until we return to this room.
só falar que eu te amo, Deus, porque não é suficiente. Não é suficiente. You're more nervous than this morning? Huh? Are you more nervous than this morning? No. no. <laughs> you seem to be nervous. Yeah, I am.
Alisa Bakina. Here. Uh, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Coleman is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Thank you, Madam Pro-Rector. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee, the present, I hereby confer upon you Elite Sabatino, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached to it by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the certificate secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Thank you. Because this is a great moment. <laughs> okay, I already looked at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Fiacciadori, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Corrector, and uh, uh, thank you to the uh, 
degree committee. It's really a great honor for me to participate in this uh, degree ceremony. Uh, my task today is to give the laudatio for uh, Alice Sabatino. So, uh, very learned Dr. Sabatino, dear Alice, uh, the very first time we met was in 2013, when I was teaching nutrition in acute kidney injury at the Master in Renal Nutrition at the Pisa University in Italy. And I remember that I was greatly impressed by, with you and with your interest, with your uh, curiosity and passion for the topics of nutrition in patients with kidney disease. And I must say that in those initial talks, the idea was born to go more in depth in the problem of the evaluation of nutritional status and muscle mass in critically ill patients with acute kidney injury and more in general in patients with kidney disease. With your background, I knew you would make an excellent member of our research group. So the job interview uh, that brought you to Parma was the beginning of a very fruitful collaboration. Since I made you the offer, join our group. And at that time, you uh, were a very young dietitian, but with considerable experience acquired in different clinical settings in Brazil and in Italy, including the intensive care units. As a research group, we have long been trying to find simple methods for assessing nutritional status in patients with the kidney disease. You pick up this important topic with great determination and the intelligence, and you made it the main topic of your research. And you were lucky enough to get an initial Young Investigator grant from the Italian Society of Parental and Interal Nutrition, and this made it possible to lay the foundation of your research work. And in subsequent years, you developed this further, and it became a beautiful master thesis. In these last eight busy years that you were in Parma, you were hardly working on developing novel and simple approaches to the evaluation of muscle mass and nutritional status in uh, uh, patients with kidney disease. And much of your research has been published and cited by many scholars around the world already. And I am very pleased to point out that your research work formed an important basis for the recent revised version of the ESPEN guidelines on nutrition in hospitalized patients with kidney disease, published just three months ago, and of which you are being the co-author with great merit. And now you are also a member of the board of the Renal Nutrition Working Group of the European Renal Association. And another aspect I would like to underline is that with your presence, our group has been really enriched with an excellent teacher. You were offering your help to anyone who is requesting it. Many of my students and resident doctors in nephrology were delighted uh, with learning about renal nutrition under your guidance and uh, with practicing with you with the use of uh, uh, novel approaches to the evaluation of nutritional status in our patient. Along these eight years in Parma, you have been also a very appreciated teacher in many ESPEN courses, and you have extended considerably your activity as teacher in many countries from Canada to Saudi Arabia. And your presentation at the meetings and courses you participate in as a teacher were always received very well. And finally, I would like to end with an even more personal note. Dr. Sabatino is not only a good scientist, an experienced renal dietitian, and a very good person, who is appreciated by all of our team. She is also a very good mother. While she was working as a researcher and renal dietitian at our nephrology unit in Parma, she had two children. And I must say that she was able to perfectly combine her work in the renal unit with her family duties. And for me, this is really a great credit to her. So congratulations. Dear Alice, with this splendid success, so your talents are being recognized. And that gives to me a, a great pleasure. And it is also my pleasure to extend my congratulations to your husband, Marcello, and all of your nice family. Uh, they have always supported you. All of us at the Nephrology Unit, we are very proud of you. 
and it has been a great pleasure and an honor to be your co-supervisor along with Professor Kuman. I wish you every, every success with your life and with your career. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, dear Dr. Sabatini, also on behalf of the Board of Deans of this, this university, uh, I would like to congratulate you uh, with the honor you have uh, acquired. I can say that uh, the whole committee was very positive about your defense, and I hope you have also yourself a good feeling about it. Uh, of course, I'd also like to congratulate your family, colleagues, and friends here in the Netherlands, but mainly in Italy, I guess. <laughs> Brazil. Um, I think um, you have done very well, and it's now time to celebrate, although probably in a small group. It's unfortunate, but it was good that you could be here. And uh, I also like the uh, members of the Corona that are being present here and also online, which is uh, a great uh, advantage of the current situation that at least this is a way you can attend this ceremony as well. Um, I wish you a lot of success with your further career. And with this, I'd like to close this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all.